You're listening to A Good Life, and I'm really pleased to have on the program this evening Professor, Professor Glenda Halliday, and her area of research is Parkinson's disease. Good evening, Glenda. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Great. And the sound is good, and we can hear you loud and clear. Um, I spoke to Dr. Danny Eckert a couple of weeks ago and he had uh, done some research in South Australia in Adelaide so I, I, I read that you've also spent some time in South Australia. That's right I had my first postdoctoral research appointment in South Australia at Flinders Medical Centre. Okay. So I, I uh, have very fond memories of of doing, I thought, quite good research in that area. Yeah, no, that's good. Um, we're very proud of that uh, facility, and it's great uh, to, to know that um, so many of the people that are doing some great re- uh, research in, uh, for your organisation, which is Neuroscience Research Australia, have uh, been to Adelaide and uh, know what it's all about here. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> good, good. Except it's a bit, a bit hard to get to out there at Flinders, isn't it? Uh, it is, but I mean, compared to Sydney, going across Sydney is just terrible compared to going across Adelaide. It's not, absolutely no comparison. Yeah, I know. That's we. we if you haven't uh, travelled interstate, um, and we think we have traffic jams for you know a half an hour here, it's nothing. Yeah. Great. Well, um, well, you're here to talk to us this evening. Uh, well, you're not here. Um, we're going to talk this evening about uh, Parkinson's disease, and uh, I, I guess we never make the assumption that people. People know what um, these diseases are about. So um, do you want to tell us? Yes. um, Parkinson's disease is a very disabling neurodegenerative movement disorder. So people actually have uh, problems with movement. It's it's an interesting disease because it has a very insidious onset and it can happen to people at any time in their life, although the majority of people get it uh, in their 50s and 60s. Um, and if you've seen a very older person move where they move slowly and a bit stooped, that's the sort of uh, primary indication you get with people with Parkinson's disease. So they're very slow, slower mm. in their movements, often um, have tremor at rest. Um, and But it happens to people earlier in life than what you would expect just for age. And it can happen in people as young as, as uh, in their teens and in their 20s. Yeah. So um, it's a, for people who have it for a long time, it's, it's very disabling. And it does uh, increase the potential mortality for the individual. Yeah, so I guess one of the very well-known people who has uh, Parkinson's is is Michael J. Fox. That's right, And uh, I think another one is Muhammad Ali, would that be? That's right, yeah, Yeah, and both of them, uh, Michael J. Fox got it very early in his life Mm. and and Muhammad Ali also got it reasonably early. Yeah, so you look at those individuals who, you know, as we would, you know, think have got it made and uh, Muhammad Ali being very fit, uh, Michael J. Fox, having a, a, you know, as far as a Hollywood a- actor or celebrity, he seemed to be quite stable and, and so forth. But uh, it, it, it's got no, um, it, it doesn't, uh, it's not selective, in, Parkinson's is not selective in who it, uh, it attacks, I suppose. Uh, no, and, and unfortunately at the moment we, for any individual, we really don't know why. So there is some causes that we do know, but they're relatively rare. Um, uh, there was a batch of, of bad drugs made on the west coast of uh, California at one time and, and that caused an outbreak of Parkinson's disease in very young people. Wow. Um, so we know that some toxins can actually cause it, um, but not in everybody, in some people. Yeah. And we know some genetic factors, but they're a minority for, for the n- numbers of people that have them. So. Right. So it, when you say the genetic factors, the, you, if, does it run in families? It, re- it rarely runs in families. It's an interesting disease where we're actually only just coming to grips with the genetics. Um, for complex diseases like Parkinson's, uh, there's a small number of people that will have a mutation in their genetic makeup that will predispose them or actually give them the disease. Are very similar to some other autosomal dominant diseases, but that's rare for Parkinson's. It's not common, right. and uh, there seems to be other factors that are involved that are to do with genetic variability and then susceptibility from the environment. And these are factors that are 
still coming to light at the moment. Uh, there's lots of research on very large numbers of people to try to understand what's the small genetic variation that may um, give people risk in, an, in a certain environment to the, to the mm. disease. But the causes are still a little perplexing at the moment. Sure. So it, it makes it then quite difficult for uh, health providers. You, you know, if, is there a way of testing, uh, you know, if, if, with imaging, uh, would you pick up uh, changes in the brain if, uh, if you were to, say, test people in their 20s? Is that, is that something that's... Uh, yeah, no, that's probably... If you have the symptoms, then there will be some imaging signs that we could... But we already have the symptoms. So at the moment, the most, um, the most accurate test is actually seeing people with the disease. Now, unfortunately, once you get the symptoms, the degeneration of a particular part of the brain has already mainly occurred. Mm. And so at that stage, uh, the disease has progressed quite a way for that particular cell type. So... Um, so, yeah, imaging, imaging would be great um, and developing some concept of what the risks are are probably also going to be very important to try to see people before they get to a, a, a time when the symptoms start because we know already that the degeneration of the dopamine cells in the brain um, has actually occurred to a, a very great extent at that time. Mm. So when, when you look at the funding for your research, um, if you look at the, the cost of care for someone over their lifetime uh, with Parkinson's, um, I, I, you know, the funding's got to go at, at one end. Um, and I often wonder, uh, it must be such a, uh, a challenge to be able to say, well, do we put a, a lot of funding into uh, the research of trying to discover uh, how this d- disease occurs um, or do we keep um, developing treatments for people who already have the disease? That, that's a, that would, is that a dilemma uh, for research? Um, well, the, the interesting thing is when you get Parkinson's disease, although I said it's, um, it, it causes a degeneration and at the time of onset you've got a significant amount of degeneration, that, that degeneration can be ameliorated by drugs currently. So we can mask the symptoms because we know those cells produce a particular chemical and if we give you chemically, chemical, that's chemical orally, we can actually mask the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. So if we could stop the progression, we actually have some symptomatic relief for patients that actually have just got the disease, have just begun with the disease. Mm. So in some ways, if we can understand what happens and how it progresses and can stop that, we could potentially um, help people to minimise the impact of the disease and to stay at a very early stage and, and never progress. What happens with patients over time at the moment is we only have symptomatic treatment and the disease keeps progressing and it's the progression of the disease and the symptomatic treatment then no longer is effective that then actually produces the biggest problem with the disability associated with this disease. And you're listening to A Good Life. I'm Barbara Chappell. You're, it's 80, Coast FM 88.7. The temperature here at Glendora is 16 degrees and the time is 7.19. And I'm speaking to Doc, uh, Professor Glenda Halliday from Neuroscience Research Australia about Parkinson's disease. Um, and before we went to our break, um, you were explaining to us um, the the progression of the disease because once uh, uh, the degeneration has started, uh, the um, there's not a lot that can be done um, apart from relief uh, medication. That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so um, I I I want to come back to Michael J. Fox uh, because I I know that he's a, a big campaigner uh, for. Um, uh, stem cell research and yeah. so is your research uh, in, into that area or, or can you, uh, I've, I've probably taken us down a path that um, I don't know if you want to talk about that but, Well uh, I, can, I can talk about my, my knowledge and, and what I'm thinking about stem cell I, um, we have been looking at um, 
the plasticity in the brains of patients with Parkinson's disease to see why it doesn't self-renew. I mean, um, you have stem cells all through your body because you can make new cells. And so, and there's stem cells in the brain to make new cells as well. But patients that have neurodegenerative disease get degeneration without replacing cells. So we've been looking at the cells in their brains. Is there anything wrong with their stem cells that they have themselves? And and um, we and, and others have actually sh- uh, found that there is um, problems with the stem cells in the brain that's due to the disease itself. Um, so there has been a number of studies which have now uh, been looking at patients that have had stem cell therapies. Now the therapies have for stem cells replacement in the brain aren't to reconstitute the brain the way it was but they're largely to give cells that will um, give that symptomatic dopamine relief. So at the moment the stem cell therapy is not ideal in that it doesn't put your brain back to what it was normally. It's used largely to deliver the drug in a way that may be more effective, more local and more associated with the neurons themselves. Um, it, so in some ways it's, you know, the hope that you um, go back to normal is probably not realistic right now. But the hope that you can deliver the therapeutic um, drug that's effective is probably where stem cell research is up to. Mm. And unfortunately for patients that have actually had good therapeutic relief with stem cells, which is not everybody, but that at autopsy when they have died at the end of their uh, life, the cells that have actually been replaced in the brain have got Parkinson's disease. Mm. So at the moment there's a lot of um, difficulties still with we put new cells in the brain but it's into a brain of a patient that has a disease and the cells themselves then, the new cells, can also get the disease. So there's something about the disease itself that we still need to know before probably stem cells even are that effective. Mm-hmm. So there's a, um, research on the disease mechanism itself and the progression of the disease because obviously newborn stem cells go into the, these patients, they're not diseased, but within, within time they become diseased. How does that happen? So mm-hmm. we're at that stage at the moment with the stem cells, um, not utilising them appropriately and also they unfortunately catch the disease over time. Mm. So we really do need to know more about the progression of the disease. So you set yourself a huge challenge there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. But uh, And the difficulty is we can only look at the progression of the disease in the brain because that's where the disease is manifest. But you can't, we really don't and can't, don't want to and can't look at the brain while people are still using it. (laughs) So it actually makes it a little bit difficult because the um, cellular changes that we have to assess are are at the molecular level, which at the moment we really can't image. Mm. It, this is uh, fascinating uh, to, for us to be able to listen to. Um, one of the reasons that I wanted to be able to um, talk to you on this program, it's, to, it's raising awareness uh, in the community about such diseases as Parkinson's, but also um, trying to tap into the community about how might we support the research and and not just perhaps through uh, funding, as pr- perhaps that's beyond most people's means, but is there... Um, ways that people it, what, what sort of support do you need with your research that um, people who are listening may be able to, to offer um, well at the moment um, we're trying to do an, a number of different things the, um, we're looking at, at trying to understand what's happening like in the blood lots of people are doing biomarker research to do that we need uh, patients that actually have the disease but also people that don't have the disease so we can actually see what's different between cohorts. Most often though it's a commitment where you have to 
uh, you know, fast and, and actually be in a position that's local to where we're trying to actually collect the um, clinical and um, biological information. Um, the other thing is that we have, um, because some of the tissue aspects we can only uh, look at at the end of life, we have these donor programs on brain donations. And these are really, I mean, people don't realise, but they're extremely important and they're unbelievably, uh, we're unbelievably grateful because living, leaving a brain is something that's so precious, that, uh, but it's something that's actually really necessary for this type of work. Um, but those uh, also to leave the brain at the end is not just sufficient. We really have to know what happened over time because it's like any like uh, reading faces they're all individual and and what's happened over life you can see but you need to know what uh, what's happened so some longitudinal following of, of people is mm. is required and we require that not just from the people that have diseases but also people that don't have the diseases because knowing what's normal is equally as important as knowing uh, what's disease it helps us understand Sure. So we, um, we've we got a contact um, number for Parkinson's South Australia, um, and I'm not sure what connection you might have uh, with the, the association here in, in, Aust- in Adelaide. Yeah, I think they have, um, they have a, a brain donor program, I think, and there's a, that's linked, I think, with both um, Adelaide University and Flinders University. Oh, I think there's actually some mechanism that's in South Australia, or there certainly was when I was there. <laughs> right. Yes. No. We, I, I've um, I've asked if we because um, your uh, research is based in uh, New South Wales. We have asked uh, if people in South Australia want further information or want to be able to contribute in some way. Um, so the e- email address, or sorry, the website address I have is www. Parkinson's S-A, so that's P-A-R-K-I-N-S-O-N-S-A dot org dot A-U and there is a phone number 83578909 that's 83578909 and um, I've you know, this is one of the things that we're trying to do through these uh, interviews is to raise awareness uh, if people um, have got some concerns. Uh, uh, I guess the first board of call would be your general practitioner. Mm, that's right. Yeah. And they're very good at... Um, Parkinson's is not as rare as one would like, and so general practitioners are usually good at uh, identifying... Um, key aspects and then hopefully referring to good clinicians there's a number of really good clinicians in South Australia yes oh that's that's good uh, so the um, your your research uh, you're going to be busy for a few years I should imagine unfortunately uh, yes yes no that that's true um, I'm hopeful that we'll be um, I'm hopeful the biomarker work will come to fruition over the next year and then um, we're actually progressing to, to really try to figure out uh, the progression in the brain so that we can target things much more specifically. Yes, so um, as you say in your notes, identifying those fa- factors uh, is the first step in understanding the progression of the disease. And if you start to understand that, you may be able to... Um, I don't know, is prevention something you're looking at or really it's to stop the progression? In patients that actually have the disease already, it would be to stop the progression. It just depends on whether or not if the progression, if the the targets that we find in progression, if there's something we can see, we can potentially then go to screening for preclinical aspects. The disease has progressed before you get the symptoms, so it really depends on what aspect we get to target as to whether or not it will be a good target to screen for Parkinson's mm. disease. Yes. So um, the progression occurs both before and after the symptom onset. So we're hoping that what we can find after the symptom onset on progression can help us actually find uh, mechanisms to identify people even before they get the symptoms. 
Yeah, that would be a huge um, relief to um, a, a lot of people um, because it is, is quite a debilitating disease and um, not, not a, a pleasant way to have to live. So I wish you all the very best with your research. And as I say, um, usually, uh, thank goodness there are people like you um, taking the time uh, and effort to, um, to do this research for, for the rest of us. So um, Professor Glenda Halliday, thank you very much. Uh, my pleasure. Thank you. Good night. Good night.